Okay, okay, okay. Oh, um, so I appreciate it. The, um, you, of course, know that Caesar fought the Civil War against Pompey, who was responsible for the um, storming of Jerusalem in 63 BC, because Caesar is assassinated after the Civil War. So I know Caesar was assassinated, I think, in 44 BC. So we have Mark Antony putting down revolt in, in uh, Palestine. And then in, it's 55 BC when uh, this war goes on. I have a note here. And uh, Pompey and the Senate fled across the Adriatic. And um, look at that. This poor Aristobulus. He's finally going to go back and take over his crown. And uh, the Pompey supporters poison him on the way back. That's really uh, tragic for the Jewish people because honestly, all these things, to my mind, contribute to the modern situation. You know, if the Jews didn't have the Herodian family in control in Palestine, there wouldn't have been all of the uh, revolutionary activity. There wouldn't have been all the upset, all the uh, agitation. There wouldn't have been all the messianism. There wouldn't have been Christianity and so on and so forth. Uh, there wouldn't have been any Holocaust. The Jews would have left, never left Palestine. I mean, you, you can drive a whole scenario for that. Just that little thing, because this is the monarchy that they actually obviously uh, felt something for. And if that was that would have been restored at that time, all subsequent history in Palestine anyway, would have been different. And since all subsequent history in Palestine influenced all of us, then everything that we think would have been different too. So interestingly enough, he was preserved in honey till later on. Anthony, when things settled down and the Civil War was over, could deliver him to the to the to the Jews. So Anthony did honor Caesar in that regard, obviously, uh, to be buried in the royal sepulchre. Notice here, death came to his son Alexander uh, in Antioch by order of Pompey. So Pompey is still at work destroying these people. Uh, again, it doesn't look like Octavius and others or Caesar would have done this kind of thing. Uh, but look, he killed him with the sword, sort of like in the Gospels. And Herod killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, meaning he beheaded him, which is what we're talking about here. Uh, and notice Josephus doesn't miss many beheadings. Any significant person that is beheaded usually pops up here. So when we have some people in the literature we're familiar with who don't pop up here, then we got to ask ourselves, seriously, why isn't he in Josephus? I particularly ask that question about James, the brother of John, who in my book I, I have very serious doubts about as a historical character. Uh, I think it's an overwrite for another character who is beheaded at that time that is in Josephus. And I think we're talking about uh, a brother of somebody who is beheaded at that time. But it is not James, the brother of John. It's brother of somebody else. It's someone the brother of James. Actually, I think it's Judas, the brother of James, who was beheaded at that time. We have him in all the early literature, and we have other material about him. And uh, I think that often these writers, when they come to something that they don't want to be forthcoming about, or they don't want you to really know about, they just switch them around a bit. And it's easy for a scribe to do that, because you can just cut out that particular section. The scrolls, anyway, are like this. They're in sort of lower like Jewish synagogues are today. And here you have this, this part. But it's not a continual, it's not a continual uh, role thing. So, but what are they? They're skinned, sewn together. And you can actually, in the scroll, see the, see the stitch marks where they are uh, stitched together. You could even unsew it and take a piece out and put another piece in if you wanted to. But the point was, you wouldn't want to recopy a whole manuscript. So you want the word count to be more or less the same of what you replace it to. I think there are things being replaced in some things. Or a codex, too. Take a page out, put another page in, but not recopy the whole thing. Watch the beheadings, watch the crucifixions. See who's beheaded and what they're beheaded for. See who's crucified, what they're crucified for and why. That's very important, and Josephus is the only and best source for that for this part of the world. So uh, this
this is considered a rebel, someone who uh, you know refuses to you know give in to Roman authority, even though he's a royal personage, he's beheaded uh, by Pompey. Um, he doesn't go too deep into um, Pompey's death. He just mentions that that he was dead. Look, he talks about the Jews in Egypt and in the temple there where Onias, uh, the, another Onias had found it. And um, they, they did battle with the Romans at a place called Jews Camp. It's interesting data here. Again, it's all ripped off from another historian. Josephus wasn't alive to witness any of this. Um, Antipater then is this Roman sympathizer of Middle Eastern origins, Greco-Arab origins. And, uh, uh, but as a mark of favor, Caesar bestowed Roman citizenship on him, exempted him from all taxation, gave him all other honors of friendship, and uh, confirmed the high priesthood on his chosen candidate, higher cause. So basically, who's the power now, really? It's Antipater is the power. He's the one who has Roman support. Higher Conus has done his work. He's basically uh, done his brother in uh, with all this fighting, infighting, and uh, is now nothing but a a stooge, if you like, of uh, Antipater. What's going to happen ultimately to Hyrcanus? After all these things, all the services he does to Herod's family, what's his thanks? He gets executed by, by Herod ultimately. Herod executes everyone. He stamps out the Maccabean family, Reuben Stalk. That is the tragedy of uh, the deaths of people like Aristobulus and his first son. And he has another son, Antigonus. What happens to him? He gets beheaded too. All the people who oppose Rome get beheaded. So you see, the beheading of John the Baptist is right in line with that. These are not people who are, you know, involved in innocent activities. These are people considered to be enemies of Rome. And uh, John the Baptist does not get killed because a woman uh, enticed a Herodian uh, governor. If a person is perceived as threatening and uh, you know, seditious, subversive, he gets executed. So this other son of Aristobulus, he tries to uh, get some sympathy for him, but the Romans take this as impudence. Uh, the impudence of Antigone is past belief. The son of an enemy of Rome, a fugitive from Rome, inheriting from his father a craving for revolution and sedition. No, I don't think Josephus wrote that. I think he copied that right out of someone else's book. Probably an Herodian civil servant, the one I was telling you about, Nicholas of Damascus. Because, you see, this is so full of hostility to the Maccabean family, and Josephus really wasn't. He even claimed to have Maccabean blood. So it would have to be some Herodian official or someone like that. And, you see, Caesar didn't consider Aristobulus a, a, a rebel against Rome. He wouldn't have freed him and sent him back. So, a son of an enemy of Rome? No, I don't think so. He's an enemy of this party of people that are running things after Rome. And he has a, a, a craving for revolution and sedition. You see, they're all going to get beheaded. Age 54 or so, Hyrcanus was too lethargic and spineless to be a real king, because he's, after all, a priest king, but I don't think there are any kings anymore. He's just high priest here. Herod, overflowing with energy, puts to death this bandit chief. Hezekiah. Well, is Hezekiah a bandit chief? No, I'm sure he's not. He's a revolutionary. This is the beginning. All through here, we've seen the word bandit in Greek less time, the same as the crucified thieves in Jesus' crucifixion scene in the New Testament, presented as bandits. This is the point of view of the author. How do I know he's not a bandit? First of all, he has a Davidic name, a Davidic king name. He's the last um, Judean king before the captivity. Of him. But in addition, it turns out this Hezekiah later on is going to be the father of Judas the Galilean, another Judean king named Judas, Judah. And Judas the Galilean is the head of a whole movement in uh, this period, which is basically the revolutionary movement that persists throughout the first century. We don't hear about the fate of Judas the Galilean in Josephus, which is odd. We, we, uh, it's hard to say what happened to him. 
though someone with a similar background, Judas Seferas, as we'll see, is killed in um, some of the revolutionary events that take place around the time of Herod's death. But how do we know this Hezekiah is a, uh, is it more than just a bandit? Because this whole line, finally when the war against Rome, right before the war breaks out in 66 AD, the son or grandson of Judas the Galilean puts on the royal purple, meaning he's making claims as a Davidic king. And that's in, that's a hundred years after this. Uh, that fellow's name is, I think is called Menachem. And uh, Josephus calls him the son of Judas the Galilean. Uh, seems to me he must have been his grandson. And the other party, the high priestly party, objects to it and throws stones. They think he's, you know, blaspheming or something. The, the Herodian priesthood, basically, and the revolutionary groups. Uh, but um, Hezekiah is one of the people representing the, the crowd. He's a Jesus type, in effect. You know, he's one of the people representing the people, not the establishment. Uh, which seems to be the popular groups are all coming out of the people. The establishment is being held in power by the Romans and the Herodians and their paid mercenaries and others. But the people are always against this establishment. They want a restoration of the Maccabean uh, line, but that's not possible. They want a restoration of the Davidic line. So this Hezekiah is the first of this Davidic line. So I've read a lot into that now, but you see, that's how I know this is not abandoned. This is more than abandoned. This is probably the first person that we have here, the implications that he's making Davidic kingly claims. Now, I've read all that in, but it's there. So he's not just abandoned. So he was caught and executed by Herod, who was at that time the uh, governor of um, Galilee. Now another of his brothers, an older brother, Notice his name, Fasael, which is the Arab word Faisal. See, Antipater is revered by the nation as if he were king. That's nonsense. So you know this is an Herodian writing this stuff. That just seems to just co-opting. Yeah. He can't write this stuff because he didn't see any of it. So he's getting it from, I think, the source I told you about. Okay, more about Hyrcanus. Uh, only uh, retaining the name of king in name, and he was absolutely, totally powerless. And Herod is continually doing whatever he wants, putting people to death, at least he's got that in there, in defiance of all Jewish law. And uh, the, the Senate, or the, the, the governing body, proto-Sanhedrin, if you like, and they want to bring Herod um, to trial for executing. So uh, Hezekiah is not just a bad, he is a heroic figure at that time, some, but we don't have the information. They say that he should be tried for the breach of the ancestral law, which forbade execution without trial. Now that's the Jewish Sanhedrin. But what does Herod do? He just walks in with what? The soldiers. So he executed the whole Sanhedrin, ultimately, when he took power. And now, in the antiquities, it introduces two other characters at that time. Polio the Pharisee and some ass. Josephus tells us the only people that survived the Sanhedrin were Polio and, and, and some ass. That's in the antiquity. It's not in the war. It's never all this in the war. Antiquities has these extra people. And they say he did this because at that time Polio and some ass had predicted his future greatness. So look, in 37 BC, Herod has fled Palestine. But he's given a Roman army by Mark Anthony. And at this time, there's all kind of unrest in Palestine because the Persians have come in. And they have sponsored this Antigonus, the only remaining son of Aristobulus, to take over the kingship and the high priesthood. So they have, you know, um, taken advantage of Jewish nationalist sentiment. So Antigonus gets the kingship for a bit under the Persians, but then Antony gives Herod an army. He comes back and he storms Jerusalem with, with Roman troops in 37 BC, and he takes over for good then. And then he has Antony execute Antigonus. Herod, though he was previously married to somebody else, marries into the Maccabean family. 
and she's the last Maccabean representative. And notice her name is Mariam. You see that? Mariam is Miriam in, uh, in Hebrew today. In Arabic, it's Mariam. In English, it's Mary. So this is the first Mary. And she's the last Maccabean princess. So I can be sure that all the people naming their daughters Mary in the next generation are naming them after this very popular princess, the last hope of the Maccabean family. So Herod, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls are against divorce, and part of the ruler, and against marrying non-Jews. You'll, you'll, you will read all of that. So of course the scrolls would disprove all this stuff, particularly that he's multiplying wives and things. Anyway, he, he apparently what had happened here, and there's another tragic event coming up here, that she agreed to marry him on the condition that one, he would that he would restore her brother, Jonathan, to the high priesthood. Does Herod keep the promise to restore this Jonathan to the high priesthood? What's he do? He kills him. Uh, you know, I wish they put some of this stuff in the in the New Testament. You might have a bit more sympathy for the Jewish people. So when Hyrcanus recommended Herod and his associates, notice this, Anthony was delighted. Years before, he had been the guest of Herod's father, who had given him a royal welcome when Gabinus and he were invading Judea. Uh, the Jews flocked to Antigonus, page 60. So there's a civil war going on even at this time, Feast of Pentecost, a lot of uh, fighting. You see, there's no peace in this country. There's no peaceful Galilee. This country is a, it's just totally riven by unrest for 150 years. Literally from the time of uh, Judas Maccabee, but certainly from the time of the Romans storming the temple in 63 to the destruction of the temple in 70, which is 135 years. But if you want to consider the Maccabee period, you can add another 100 years. If you want to consider the Bar Kokhba uprising, you're dealing with 250 years of constant revolutionary strife. Anyway, Galilee, you see, is a hotbed of revolutionary uh, sentiment. When we came to Galilee, they found the inhabitants in a state of armed revolt. This is the real Galilee, not the peaceful fishermen, it seems, that we have. And the Jews are always on the side of people like Antigonus. They're the popular people. Uh, Faisal is captured by Antigonus, Herod's brother, and he runs into a wall, supposedly, and kills himself, bashes his brains out. Um, so Anthony was really upset that Herod was driven out of the country by the Antigonus. And, uh, but he hates Antigonus too at the end of this chapter. And uh, by the way, uh, when um, Herod's father is given Roman citizenship, the whole family gets Roman citizenship in perpetuity. So they're all Roman citizens from that moment on. I think that's where Paul got his Roman citizenship from myself, because I think Paul is from the Roman family. And we have indication in the letters of Paul where he sends regards in Romans to his kinsman, the littlest Herod, at the end of Romans uh, 16. He says he calls him his kinsman, and Herod is not a common name. The Roman citizenship you know, is something unique here, and not many people have it. You have to give conspicuous service to Rome, you can't just get a Roman citizen. So what happened, Masada comes to the fore in his chapter 3. Herod had put his brother-in-law there, and he had them marrying there. Masada is his fortress along the Dead Sea. But Herod is coming down through the country, and he's at this place called Arbana, it says, which is in Galilee. And there, there are bandits there. So remember our situation in the Maccabean books? One of these so-called bandits in the caves is an old man, a father of seven children. And uh, Herod again is, is portrayed like Titus will be later, is begging the old man to come out, that he will spare him and his children. And the old man, his response was, one by one he ordered his children to come out and he killed each son. And Herod cut to the heart stretched out his hand to the old man, begging him to spare his children. Oh. And the seven brothers all died. And the old man then um, mocks Herod. And after killing his wife too, he flings their bodies down from the precipice and leaps over the edges. 
But you see how, how intent Herod is in getting these people? His departure removed all restraint from the habitual troublemakers in Galilee. So we're in about 35 BC, and already Galilee is a, a, is a hotbed of habitual troublemakers. We finally get Herod's 74 stormtroopers scaling the wall. These are all Roman troops. The Romans make fun of Antigonus, calling him Antigone. Uh, who was Antigone? She's a hero of Greek tragedy, so they're laughing at his name. Uh, but you see, Herod didn't, I guess he's taken him prisoner by this point. It was a frightful carnage. And the Romans do storm the temple after four months. And, uh, but notice, it's very important. Did Pompey do anything to the temple except go in and look? No. He just went in and they say he was impious. And he was sacrilegious. He went into the inner sanctum but didn't touch any of the treasure. Did Herod? No. According to this, and do I believe him? Well, I think so. Uh, he, he drove back the force of arms, thinking victory more terrible than defeat if such people got a glimpse within the veil. He doesn't even let them go into the inner sanctum. He wants to ingratiate himself. And uh, everyone wants to pillage. But he pays the soldiers, they say here, out of his own coffin. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the thing. We have to, it's important because the Habakkuk Pesher says that the that the uh, Kittim, or the uh, Yeter Ha'amim, plundered the temple and took the temple treasure. And to my mind, the only time that happened was when Titus and Vespasian stormed the temple in 70 AD and built the Roman Colosseum with the treasure. Uh, that and selling prisoners as slaves. All the money they made off the Jewish war. Sosius was the Roman commander. He dedicated to God a golden crown and bade farewell to Jerusalem. Tank. He took Antigonus to Antony. Who's Antigonus now? Aristobulus, his second son. What happened to the first? He'd already been beheaded. What happened to this guy? He's beheaded too. Fallen the ruler, clinging to life to the very end, though hope was dead, died as such a coward deserved by the act. He didn't make the mistake of treating all the citizens alike, however, King Herod now, you notice. He took, he bestowed on, this is 37 BC, on all those who had taken his side. But the supporters of Antigonus, he liquidated. So we're getting the liquidation of all the resistors here. So that's why the Maccabean resistors are no longer the same by the time we get to the Sanhedrin and Jesus time. Because he's going to make it clear in this book in the Antiquities that he took such vengeance on everyone that anyone who resisted him he killed. And uh, it's either this book or the, uh, or the Antiquities. It says that he went around and, and disguised himself to see who was complaining against him. And then he'd go back and he'd take these people, people secretly to Makaroth, uh, a fortress on the other side of the Jordan. That's where John the Baptist was executed. And torture them and execute them. This is the Jewish king. I want you to know that popular Jewish king who wants to kill Jesus. <laughs> oh, of course he wants to kill anyone who is going to be popular with the people who resist him. <laughs> Since he's not popular and he's not a Jewish king. Uh, and Cleopatra and uh, Herod didn't get on. So he sliced off large parts of their territory, including the palm grove at Jericho, which balsam is produced and gave them to Cleopatra. And what they were getting there was balsam. And we found in Kumran, we found some jars of balsam. In there. Some, some of the archaeologists found in, their, in certain clefts of rocks a jar of balsam. And uh, they were getting it from, the, there are palm groves down there even now, and they were getting, that's where they were producing it. Cleopatra wanted it, it was a rich place. You can read more about this civil war here between Octavius and so on. Here's what Herod was doing in 81. In the 15th year of his reign, he restored the existing temple, enclosed it with an area double the former size. That's the modern temple that you see. It's an Herodian edifice. He didn't care what the cost was. He liked to build big things to impress the Romans. He built not just here, he built them everywhere. And also keep people quiet. He had great colonnades that ran around the entire temple and a fortress that towered over one side of it, he named Antonia in honor of Mark Anthony. His own palace he built in the upper city. 
and I cannot think further along on that page of any suitable spot in the kingdom that he left without some tribute of esteem to Caesar. So this guy is the biggest sucker up for going. He names cities in honor of the Caesars, Tiberius, Caesarea, Antonia. You know, this is a Jewish king, you see, who, re who represents the interests of the people. He also did not neglect to make his own uh, memory secure. He built fortresses. One he called Herodian, an artificial hill, the shape of a woman's breast, named it after himself, and some other fortresses that I told you about. So now, the next chapter, four, the back of you have some of the genealogies of his various wives. He had five children by Marion, two were girls. The youngest died at school in Rome. The two eldest were left. This is page 86. But she hated him passionately. So that's, there's your clue to what's really going on here. She had good reason to be revolted by his actions. She openly took him to task for what, oh, I didn't get the killing of her grandfather, Hyrconus, but he obviously executed Hyrconus at some point. And her brother Jonathan, for he had not spared him, even though he was a young youngster. Because he had given him, as he had obviously promised, the priesthood in the 17th year. But after doing that, he immediately had him executed. Because there it is. When he put on the sacred garments, the priestly garments, and approached the altar during uh, the feast, the whole crowd burst into tears. And the boy was there for a night, taken to Jericho. And by Herod's command, the Gauls, who were his mercenary uh, guard, took him to the swimming pool and drowned him there. And he finally charges her with adultery with the husband of his sister, Salome, who he wants to get rid of, a guy called Joseph. I hate to tell you, but this is the first Joseph and Mary story. Heather has a brother-in-law called Joseph. And he had charged him with adultery with his wife, Mary, Mary, to get rid of both of them. The Romans don't like that he does this kind of thing. But he has them executed because he said when he went to Rome to get the kingship from, uh, 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 from um, Octavian, he had left her in his charge in Masada, the fortress by the Dead Sea, and he claimed that there was an angry pank. Further along here on 93, these family races are really important. Uh, he has another relative called Coast of Bar, and her Salome's next husband. The Salome's got a lot of husbands. He gave her the, her hand after the execution of her former husband. Uh, I don't think that guy lasts too long either, because he's considered a little bit too rebel, you know, too um, independent-minded. I think Herod gets rid of him too. Finally, and, uh, at the end of this chapter, he puts his own children to death by Miriam. Miriam's sons by him because he's jealous that they're more popular than he is. That, I think, is where Herod wanting to kill the Jewish children comes from. He is willing to, uh, to kill anybody, but he actually kills his own children by Miriam. Executes them. She's already been executed. He sent them to Rome to be brought up, but then, of course, why would the crowd prefer them to him? Oh, the Maccabean blood. They've still got some Maccabean blood. And this continues to be the preferred line in his family, even though he's got ten wives with lots of uh, offspring. You watch the, 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 the line with Maccabean blood. That's the only line that has any claim to the people's uh, affection. Agrippa one, Agrippa two, are all part of that line. I mean, this is like, of course, it's not something you want to read for our everyday pleasant creation. This is gruesome stuff. Yeah. But it also, I mean, gives you a different picture of Palestine and what you get from other environments. Anyway, if you write the exam, don't like it, you can throw it in the wastebasket, go out and do a paper, that's the thing. You don't have to hand in your exam. But we didn't mention that the Roman uh, general who uh, storms Jerusalem with, uh, with Herod is called Sosius, not that it matters. In the antiquity, Josephus makes it clear that the, uh, again, Polio and Simaeus recommend to the people not to resist Herod. But they are the Pharisees. As Paul says, he's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. These are, this is basically the Pharisee approach to this people, you know. 
accommodate to Roman power. Don't resist. And it says they uh, recommended opening the gates to Herod the same way that they didn't want to prosecute Herod earlier. So in return, Herod kills all the previous members of all the members of the previous Sanhedrin except for them. This is heroic behavior to, uh, you know, um, open the gates to people like this. No, I wouldn't think so. But since the whole of the Jewish people is totally ignorant of this history, it's easy to make those people heroes because they don't know anything more than most Christians. In fact, probably less. Anyway, Herod has already executed Hyrcanus. He also executes um, the mother, as I recall, of Hyrcanus or Hyrcanus. The, the Miriam's, no, it's Miriam's mother. She's the last one to go, Miriam's mother, after everyone else is gone. I guess she's the daughter of Hyrcanus. Anyway, they all get executed in the end. That's how he pays back for favors rendered. And he's undisputed uh, king by this point. We are now down to 4 BC. Herod has uh, basically uh, been in power for uh, 30 years or so. I think he started re remodeling the temple in 26 BC as I recall from uh, what Josephus just told us earlier. According to Josephus, the temple is all worked on for the next hundred years or so. Just in time for the Romans to destroy it in 68 and 70 to burn it all down. The stones are still there. That's what the Wailing Wall is. And that's what you have. The dome on the rock is sitting on top of the Herodian platform there. So, right before he's going to die, I think it's your page 115, we get this really interesting episode about the two, he calls them in my translation rabbis. The Greek is sophist. Sophistry, a uh, philosophical person who doesn't teach good wisdom but bad wisdom according to Socrates and Plato. You see, so one of these people is called Judas son of Sepphoraeus. And the other is called Matthias. <coughs> So we're into Maccabean names still again. Ultimately, these two rabbis or sophists or teachers are executed. But they tell the young people, if you want to strike a blow for God, to pull down the works that have been erected in the country contrary to the laws of their fathers. Now we're going to get into the Maccabean thing again. So we're 150 years later. And this thing is still going on. They urge the rabbis to cut down this Roman eagle that had been put over the gate of the, uh, of, uh, the temple compound. This was a glorious thing to die for the laws of the fathers. And for people who made such an end, then you would be uh, get resurrected. Remember? There would be a um, sure hope of immortality. Same thing, the same for resurrected. Whereas the mean spirit, poor spirited, who don't know anything about, this is said rab rabbinical wisdom, I don't know what the original Greek is here, but we're talking about martyrdom here, cling to life out of ignorance and choose death by disease or old age or something, rather than death in a righteous cause, death in the way of righteousness. This is the doctrine that has been emerging since the Maccabean period, re-emerging here. So why the young men do that? because they think Herod's dying. But they're arrested. Herod doesn't die. He's just sick. They are questioned, who told you to do this? Uh, the law of their fathers. It's the same answer the brothers give. Why made them so cheerful when they're going to make This is exactly Maccabees 2. From the knowledge that they would enjoy greater blessings after their death. And so the king exploded with rage. He called them temple robbers who plead the law as an excuse, wanted them to be punished for sacrilege, but he was afraid of the people maybe getting upset by being too harsh here. So he just took the ones who had lowered themselves from the roof and the rabbis. He burnt alive. The rest of the men he handed over to the tennis for execution. Anyway, now the, uh, the oracles, the diviners, whoever these people are, are saying that uh, this disease he has is what he did to the two rabbis or wherever these teachers were. He went over to Jordan and uh, he took the hot bath at this Kalirho place. 
he knows he's dying here. So now his son, sister's got another husband. Salome has got a, a Lexus now as her husband. Helsius or Lexus. So none of these people are Jewish. Helsius, uh, if you look in the, carefully in the antiquities, is an uh, Inuman, Edomites, Arabs. I know the Jews will greet my death with wild rejoicing, popular king. But I want to be mourned anyway. So arrest all these notables, put them in this uh, in this stadium, and when I die, kill them all, so that everyone in Judea will be weeping. Again, I think the killing all the Jewish children thing is a mixture of his killing his own children in this episode, here. and also the Moses thing. It's a three-part uh, source for that uh, episode in Matthew. Okay, uh, so Archelaus does succeed him, page 118. He's a son by another of his wives, I think a Samaritan wife, I think his mother's Maltese. He's got another brother called Antipas here, page 118. He's called, these are tetrarchs. Tetrarchs is the rule of fourth of the country. So since Antigonus' death, Herod reigned 33 years from the time of his proclamation as king when he got to Rome and got his proclamation 40 years. Yeah, that's quite a long time right here, and Archelaus is the next one. He's mentioned in the Gospel of Archelaus was king, and, and Jesus' parents uh, returned to, uh, or as Matthew, one of the times. So, there's a lot of unrest now under Archelaus, and he's not able to hold things under control. So, the Matthew Gospel has Jesus born while Herod is still alive, so that has to be before 4 B.C., but the Luke Gospel has Jesus born at the time of the census of Cyrenius or Quirinius, and that's here, 7 AD. So the two Gospels, of course, contradict each other. So nobody knows when Jesus was born, really. And the other Gospels don't deal with it. And so the problem here is the taxation. The census has to do with the taxation. And the reason they're taxing here is um, because uh, they remove Archelaus. Now, at the beginning, Archelaus, you see, lightens the taxation here in chapter 6, page 120. And the people want vengeance for the ones who had died for the laws of their country. So these are popular revolutionaries as always. And they demand the appointment of a high priest of greater piety and cleanliness. Purity. Now the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's what they're interested in, the appointment of the high priest. And this has to be a perfectly righteous high priest. And that's not what's going on here. What's going on here, as the governors come in, the Rhodian tetrarchs and things, you're getting an appointment of corrupt high priests. These are the Sadducees. They have nothing like the Sadducees previously who would have been pro-Maccabean revolutionaries. So you're getting a total change of establishment. And uh, everything happens at the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, Passover time. That's, of course, when the problem happened with Jesus, too. Page 121. There's a great influx in the country. Those who were mourning the dead rabbis massed in the temple, increasing the sedition. And Archelaus was incapable of preventing the disease infecting the whole population. So again, over and over again, the population is diseased by revolutionary sentiments. The disease is revolution and sedition. I think at one point when Paul is brought up for the Roman authorities, he's asked, are you one of these disease carriers? upsetting the whole Roman Empire. The disease, the disease carriers are these people here. So when this king sends his people out, they help the Roman cohort with stones, and then they go on sacrificing. We get a lot of revolutionary strife here before uh, Archelaus is finally uh, removed. Page 123 on the eve of Pentecost, people assemble to vent their wrath. Enormous crowd gathered from Galilee, Idumea, Jericho, Perea, so there's constant agitation. There's one guy in Sepharad is the leader, is Judas, the son of Hezekiah. There he is. 126. That's Judas the Galilean. The Antiquities is clear about this. He and a guy called Zadok lead the revolt. So he's the son of Hezekiah, remember? This is Hezekiah. This is almost 50 years old. So he can't be such a young man here. Unless it's the crown. There's a shepherd king here. He puts on the crown. So you see, we have a whole series of messianic uh, individuals developing. As we would expect. 
once the McAmean family is basically eliminated and destroyed, then a new principle comes into effect. And we have uh, at the end of this chapter of Simon the Essenes. There are three schools of thought, 133. The Essenes are the most severe. Notice that the thing that triggers the discussion of the sex is the there's all this revolutionary unrest, particularly Judas the Galilean, who, as he said, is the author of the fourth school, but he doesn't really tell us much about them. But he doesn't even call them zealots at this point, but later on we hear that they're zealots. But not till the war against Rome does he start using the word zealot to describe them. Anyway, they don't like wealth, promiscuity, they consider oil to be uh, polluting. James' brother Jesus, if you know anything about him, didn't use oil and wore only linen. They only wear linen, it says here. They're wonderfully devoted to the ancient writers. He describes them in great detail. Whether it's from the Oreo work or his own, I don't know. He says he spent time in his autobiography in the wilderness. When he was young, he tried all the sexes. He spent time with a, a bather called Banis who uh, only wore uh, vegetable matter, clothing, not animal, linen. They swear to impart their teaching to no one. They expel people from their group. The Pharisees are the next. And this is where the New Testament gets its picture of Pharisees from. Because all the New Testament really knows about Pharisees is that they believe in the resurrection of the dead and the Sadducees go. And that's all he says here about the place. So the authors of the New Testament are picking that up off. There seems there's much more to say about Pharisees than that. Uh, and he says, that's all basically I wish to say about uh, the sex. But you see, he doesn't tell us about Judas the Galilee, with whom he began the description. Now in Antiquities, he actually doesn't give the Essenes a long description like he does in the war, but he seems to cut a piece from his description of the Essenes and add it to his description of the uh, so-called four philosophy of Judas the Galilee at the beginning of Book 18 that there was one Judas a Golanite, that means from the Golan, whose name, uh, a city whose name was Gamala, so he comes from this place up in the Golan Heights above the Sea of Galilee, who uh, had a companion called Saduk, a Pharisee. S-A-D-D-U-K. And they were zealous to draw the people to revolt, saying that taxation was no better than slavery. And he asserted the people to assert their liberty. And they inspired a fourth philosophical sect among us. But because of them, our country was filled with tumults. And they laid the foundation for our future misery because of their way of thinking, which before we were unacquainted with, he claims. But I think the Maccabee books already have this. And this rather because the infection, this disease, which spread thence among the younger group people were, who were zealous for it, brought our people to destruction. So he blames the group of Judas and Satuk in 7 AD when Cyrenius came to Palestine to uh, take the census. So just as Jesus is born at the time of the census, so is the movement of Judas and Satuk. And he says here, one Yoazer, a son of Boethus, which was another of uh, Herod's wives. Miriam was the uh, son of the daughter of Boethus, a priest he brought in from Egypt. He argued that you should pay the Roman tax. The Judas the Galilean group against it. He adds here, the fourth sect, the Judas the Galilean group, they were also called Galileans, which is interesting when Jesus' followers, are you a Galilean? Does that mean are you from Galilee or a follower of Judas the Galilean? They agree in all things with the Pharisees, but they have an inviolable attachment to liberty. And they say, God is their only Father or Lord. So in Palestine, you see, nothing belongs to Caesar, everything belongs to God. So when you say, whose picture's on the coin, in the New Testament picture of Jesus and the tax, uh, Jesus says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar and God's what is God's. That's supposed to be the Pharisee position. But the zealot position would be, no. Nothing is rendered to Caesar, everything to God. God rules here, not Caesar. So uh, the question is, uh, did Jesus really say those things? I mean, personally, I don't think he did. Uh, because um, you know, a lot of people don't know that he said those things uh, of his followers. I think Paul said those things. And Paul encouraged the people to pay the taxes in Romans, as I think 
got told me. And the question is, that's what the historical Jesus is all about. What can we really say about Jesus and what can we be sure of and what are we not sure of? Anyway, you see the, uh, this picture in the Antiquities is much different. The Essenes it just gives a paragraph to. There are about 4,000 men that live in the way of Essenes, he says. Then he said, as far as the Jews of Galilean group, in Florus, which was the governor of time of the uprising, the nation began to grow mad with this distemper, as he puts it. He was the procurator who made the Jews go wild by the abuse of his authority and made them revolt against the Romans. So by the time of Florus' time, 66 AD, the Jews were absolutely, totally insane with this Judas the Galilean philosophy. So what's the popular philosophy? The revolutionaries. Not the Pharisees, not the Sadducees. The revolutionaries. And you just have to read it carefully to get that. And it's clear because the revolution is popular. This Yoazer becomes high priest, by the way. Anyway, that's from the Antiquities. Anyway, here we have Judas of Galilean at the beginning of chapter 7. Caponius was sent as governor. Notice, he has the authority from Caesar to inflict the death penalty. So only the Roman governor has the authority to do the death penalty, lest anyone have any mistakes about that, too. And Caponius is uh, the governor, but this uh, Quirinius is in the, uh, he's the district commissioner. In this time, a Galilean named Judas, he doesn't go into the movement, you see, because this is written 20 years before the other one. He probably isn't comfortable telling about it. Tried to stir the natives to revolt and said, they submitted to paying taxes to Rome after serving only God, they accepted human masters. This was a rabbi with a sect of his own, quite unlike the others. But he never tells us about it in the war. He tells us about the other three. Anyway, the uh, ethnarchy of Archelaus came under Roman rule. This is 7 AD. And then suddenly, the next thing we hear, Tiberius sends Pontius Pilate out. What's happened here? We have about uh, a 30 year gap. Just the period we want to know about. Gap. What explains that? Well, I guess think Josephus a source broke off here. The Herodian source, uh, probably, um, as I told you, Nicolaus of Damascus and others. And he doesn't have another source. So he's not really able to start telling us about anything until about <coughs> 35, 40 AD. Because he's born in, um, I think he's born in um, 36 or something. So, you know, there's not much left here to tell because he's not telling it to us. So we're already in the thir late 30s and 40s. You have to go to the antiquities, he tells a bit more because of this, you know, greater willingness to be forthcoming. He dates John the Baptist around 36 AD. He doesn't uh, date him in the way the New Testament dates him. This is long after, I think, uh, Pontius Pilate has been recalled. He puts it around the time of Gaius Caligula. Herod the Tetrarch had married the daughter of Aretas, the Arab king, and lived with her a great while. And when he was in Rome, he lodged with Herod, who was his brother but not by the same mother. For this Herod was the son of the high priest Simon's daughter. That's another son of Herod. Herod the Tetrarch, meaning this is really Herod Antipas. Or we fell in love with Herodias, who was the daughter of Aristobulus, blah, 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 the sister of Agrippa. The husband of Herodias here is not Philip. It's, it, Philip is the husband of her daughter Salome, the dance of the seven bells. The New Testament doesn't know the name of the door. Only Josephus gives us the name of the door. Okay, so there was a war between uh, this Herod the Tetrarch, who's really Herod Antipas, they're all called Herod, that's the point. Really Herod Antipas. And the other one is not Herod Philip, it's Herod Herod. 
So the previous husband is this Herod. Philip is the husband of Salome. This is all complicated. And these are all half-brothers. Herodias is their niece. And uh, she's married to him, uh, to him, and then he takes her. But he only says that Philip didn't have any children by Salome. He doesn't say that... Uh, anything about the idea of not having children or having children. So um, let's go back here then, since you know the New Testament, let's finish this. Uh, now the Jews thought the destruction of Herod's army, because of he had previously been married to Aretas, the Arab king's daughter from across Jordan, uh, came to a bad fate in this uh, military engagement with the Arabs across the Jordan because of what he did to John, who was a righteous man, and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue both as right, righteousness towards your fellow man, and piety towards God. And so to come to baptism for that, that immersion or washing would be acceptable to him, God, if they made use of it, not in order for the putting away of sin, so it wasn't for remission of sins, as the New Testament seems to think, but for purification of the body only, supposing the soul had already purified beforehand by righteousness. Now when uh, many others came to follow him, and he had a great following, they were greatly moved by hearing his word, so he's a popular Jewish leader. Herod feared the influence that John had over the people might put it in his power to raise a, an uprising, for they seemed ready to do anything he would advise, and so he thought it best that he put him to death and prevent any mischief he might cause, and not bring himself difficulties by sparing a man he might later repent of having been too lenient with. Accordingly, he sent to John as a prisoner to Machaerus, the fortress I have previously mentioned, and there had him put to death. So, that's the Josephus picture of John. It's from the antiquity. And this is around 38, that's why I haven't uh, given it to you earlier, because this war that uh, uh, Maritus and Herod the Tetrarch is around 38. Um, he sends Pilate according to page 138. The first thing that happens, they want to, the Romans want to put the busts of Caesar into Jerusalem. That is the ensigns with the bust of Caesar because by that time Caesar was considered a god and they had the bust of Caesar on their ensigns. And the Jews saw this happening and they got very upset and they rushed to Pilate and Caesarea and begged him to remove the insignia, the, the pictures of the Roman emperors uh, from Jerusalem. And at a prearranged signal, Pilate had the Jews assaulted by his troops in full armor, ring three deep, and um, he said that he would uh, cut them all to pieces if they didn't uh, allow the, uh, the, uh, you know, the images in. And the Jews fell to the ground and bent to their ne necks and said they would be rather killed rather than uh, transgress the law. So then Pilate uh, relented. Um, at another point, he has uh, this thing built from the money he takes from the temple treasury. He has Jews uh, who had gone to a jack club to death Others trampled by the mob and so on. And Fado, even the Jewish philosopher Alexander, gives even a worse picture and says that he was so brutal that uh, he was removed from the governorship. He's the only Roman governor to be so removed. So once again, uh, we don't have a gentle pilot. And as far as the Samaritans, I don't know if it's in here or the antiquities, we have an episode where the Samaritans have a messianic leader. And Pilate goes to Samaria and crucifies all of the uh, Samaritan troublemakers and uh, let, lets the troops loose on the mobs there. Um, Tiberius is the emperor up to about 37. Gaius Caligula comes in. He's a bit mad. He wants his bust up in the temple. He didn't like what he heard about the, uh, the situation with Pilate, obviously. Petronius, with three legions, comes in. Petronius is clever. 
He, he holds up until uh, Caligula is assassinated. And he didn't do it because he knew there'd be an uprising. Then um, this Agrippa I, finally, is to some extent in a situation of favored status with these Caligula Claudia ones. And he has the Maccabean blood, even though it's quite diluted. I would say maybe he's either a quarter or an eighth Maccabean by this time. He had three daughters, Bernicia, Mariam, and Drusilla. That's really important because Bernicia and Drusilla both appear in the Book of Acts. Agrippa II, his son, also appears in the Book of Acts. Paul talks very cordially with these people in the chapter 20s of the Book of Acts. He has interviews with these people. Drusilla is introduced there, and she's not even mentioned. He calls her a Jewess. He doesn't even mention that. To the author doesn't tell us that she's an Herodian princess. And Josephus tells us that she was, that she left the religion of her ancestors. But this time the Herodians have been Judaized. Uh, and um, Drusilla, uh, Josephus tells us just what she wasn't. She left the religion of her forefathers to marry Felix, the Roman governor, in the 50s, who was a very brutal Roman governor after Pontius Pilate. Uh, Mariam, her sister, had several marriages, finally to the uh, head of the community in Alexandria, who was the very wealthiest person in the Middle East, Philo's brother, or nephew. Very wealthy Jewish family in Alexandria, Egypt. She divorced several husbands and married him, each one richer than the next, and then Bernice was reputed, according to Josephus, to be the mistress of her brother, Agrippa II. Ultimately, she was the mistress of Titus, the destroyer of Jerusalem. And Titus took her to Rome like a kind of Cleopatra. So she jumped from person to person. She also was very rich. She would be Herodias's niece. She would be the daughter of Herodias's brother. Herodias's brother is Agrippa I. That's why all these people want to marry Herodias because they want to get close to Agrippa, who, after the death of Herod, king of Chalcis, Claudius gave the throne to his nephew, Agrippa, son of the first Agrippa. So um, we also should have Agrippa I dying somewhere here in the um, 50s or late 40s. <laughs> Notice, at this point, Stephen, a slave of Caesar, is mentioned as being beaten by revolutionaries outside the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, there's constant bandits everywhere. The Jews in the whole country were in were in flames. Uh, there would have been a tumult in the temple <coughs> because on Passover, I think this is page 143, uh, a Roman centurion who was on the temple colonnade, they were there to forestall rioting at uh, these times by an unruly mob. Uh, he infuriated the crowd by lifting up his garment, meaning he showed them his uh, uncircumcised or whatever sexual parts, which would upset them at Passover, obviously, and then bent over indecently and turning his backside towards the Jews, made a noise as indecent as his attitude. He blew a fart at them. Now, to me, you see, this is the real history. I don't accept the idealized history. This is what the real stuff of history looks like. It's crude, it's pretty gross, but it, this is the stuff people remember. And that caused a huge riot in the temple. The crowd rushed around hurling stones at the soldiers, and it was in the, it was in the aftermath of that that this C. Stephen is beaten and uh, he's robbed of his things. That's also developed in the, uh, in the uh, antiquities. In any case, the whole country is seething with unrest. The crowds abandoned the feast, set out for Samaria. There's problems with Samaria. There were bandits and revolutionaries. And finally, we get here, 146, I guess it is, The high priest Jonathan, son of an of Ananus. Tried to calm things down. 
But in the meantime, Quadratus, who was the Roman legate and commandus, took many of these revolutionaries into life and crucified them at Lydda. Well, the Romans were crucifying all these revolutionary leaders all the time. So I, I don't think the New Testament story is very credible in this uh, background, because they would have to be revolutionaries, all these people. But anyway, you have to make that up aside for yourself on that, but it's not mentioned here. Some are beheaded, some are crucified. Now Felix takes over, and uh, the bandits whom he crucified, and the local inhabitants in league with them whom he caught and punished were too many to count. And the country was cleared of bandits and another tribe known as Sicarii, knife people, terrorists really, according to Josephus, came up. And they were so called because of the small daggers that they hid under their garments with which they stabbed or assassinated people. And then the first to be so assassinated was Jonathan, this son of Bananas we heard. So these people were killing the high priests. Oh, but Ananus is the person that the New Testament says was at the trial of Jesus. So that means the revolutionaries were killing the people involved in the trial of Jesus. So that means that the Jewish mob is taking vengeance on all these people that the New Testament is portraying as having been representing the Jewish mob, which is not the case. All these people are being assassinated. Later on, when the war starts, they burn all the high priest's palaces and kill as many high priests as they can. That is the Jews do. So I like to group people by their enemies. To me, like enemies are similar, and I think the revolutionaries have the same enemies as the Jesus people in the scripture. So, and in fact, one of the people responsible for them, according to the New Testament, the execution of Jesus is here killed by the terrorist groups. And then later, another brother of his, another Ananus, Ananus, the son of Ananus, the brother of this Jonathan, is killed by the mobs when the uprising occurs, and his palace and everything burned, and he's the one responsible for the death of James, the brother of Jesus. We have this Egyptian here, this we're already in the, just almost in the 60s, who's leading a huge number of people from the Mount of Olives to enter the, enter the, the Jerusalem, so then the Mount of Olives, you see, the, prominent location for revolutionary unrest where Jesus and his associates also are pictured as uh, congregating. So when this died down, another festering saw appeared. So 147. The religious frauds and bandit chiefs joined forces and drove numbers to reason of vault, inciting them to strike a blow for freedom, threatening with death any who submitted to Roman rule. Men willingly chose slavery would be forcibly free. Then, splitting into groups, they raged over the countryside, plundering the well-to-do, killing the occupants, setting fire to the villages, raging madness, penetrated every corner of Judea. Day by day, the fighting blazed ever more fierce. This is really the first picture of a situation of in revolutionary turmoil, class struggle. And Festus was, uh, was sent out and then another governor, Albinus, and uh, basically we're coming up to the war here. So in the, in, the, uh, in the antiquities, he says these people are in intent more dangerous than the revolutionaries, these religious frauds who joined forces with the bandit chiefs. The imposters, he calls them, pseudo-prophets. The next procurator Festus had to deal with the chief curse of the country, this bandit and then Albinus, and then Florus. These are the Roman governors leading up to the war. He says at one point here, um, this plea made Florus still more infurious. The total Roman that perished that day were around 3,600. Um, used to scourge even the upper class people and nail them to the cross, even if they enjoyed Roman equestrian status. I mean, he was crucifying, killing all kinds of people. Anyway, I can't. I just want to get to the outbreak of the uprising, and then we'll stop here. Um, then some people, chapter 9, took over Masada. And it turns out these are the Sicarii who take over Masada.
we don't know that at this point, but by the end we realize these. So the Sicarii are just the extreme revolutionaries. They're not, they're the extreme zealots. So Judas the Galilean is the founder of both groups. He calls the Sicarii after the, uh, the knife that they supposedly wear over their garments. but I think it's more complicated than that. Anyway, so um, this is situation of total um, disaster. The lower priesthood abolished the <coughs> sacrifice offered to Rome and Caesar himself. Even though the chief priests and the others, the Herodian priests if you like, and the most prominent Pharisees uh, want to continue the sacrifice to the emperor and to foreigners. And so the issue is sacrifice to foreigners and the Roman. And they also, um, at some point, they don't let Agrippa and his sister Bernice into the city. They stone them. Menachem, one, the son of Judas of Galilean that we mentioned, who led the revolt of Quirinius' time, broke into the, uh, to the uh, ar armory. So we're getting tremendous problems here. And then uh, I don't know where the actual breakout of the war is, but he says at one point that the Revolutionary Party wants to encourage the poor to revolt against the rich. And they uh, want to burn all the debt records and they stop sacrifice on behalf of Romans in the, in the uh, temple and other foreigners. And then also <coughs> these more collaborating groups invite the Romans, the Roman army into the, into the city to put down the uprising. That's what he meant in the early part that the Jews invited them in, that the chief priests, the Pharisees, and the men of power invite the Roman military commander to come into the city and put down the uprising. At that point, the crowds overwhelm the Roman soldiers and there's a huge victory for the Jewish partisans. And the whole city is free. And the city remains free until it comes under siege two years later in 68 or 69. So in 66, the uprising breaks out and um, it's led in various ways. You can read the rest of this yourself, Josephus, governor of Galilee. Okay. Uh, bring the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I'm going to be doing it off of my book, The Dead Sea Scrolls and the First Christians. With the last call for anything on the Josephus material. What I was interested in was the run up to the war against Rome, and actually he treats that better in the antiquities than he does in the Jewish war. And he has a lot of material there about um, the. Um, antagonism between the high priest class and the uh, sort of people, you might say, or the more extreme groups among the people who actually get to the point where they're throwing stones at each other and uh, the one group is assassinating people in the other group. As I told you, it's really one of the first social revolutionary situations on, uh, on record. And uh, the interesting thing is the um, the antagonism, I think, that you get, particularly over um, the acceptance in the temple of sacrifices on behalf of foreigners and um, other per people of that kind, and uh, in particular the Roman emperors. Apparently, the Roman emperor gave money for a daily sacrifice because the Romans tolerated a lot of different religions as long as they weren't doing anything particularly subversive. Uh, they were very superstitious and they, uh, they felt all, all religions were you know, uh, worthy of uh, at least concern, if not fear. The Roman emperor apparently was uh, giving, he was the richest person obviously in the country, and he was giving a lot of um, money for daily sacrifices on his behalf in the temple. And the zealot priests, the lower ones, not the high priests, not the ones who were collaborating with the Herodian family and uh, uh, the upper class groups, so-called Pharisees and Sadducees and groups like that, but the sort of
sort of uh, people priests got control of the temple and uh, stopped sacrifice on behalf of the, uh, the Roman emperor and other foreigners, and that was the signal for the war against Rome. And Josephus, as usual, being a somewhat establishment person himself, rails against that, as usual. He's totally outraged. He says, this is an innovation with which our forefathers were before unacquainted. And that just is not true. As I think I've told you, in Ezekiel, when he has his vision of the reconstructed temple at the end of Ezekiel, in 44, it's really what's considered to be the, the Zarekite statement where Ezekiel is giving his vision of the reconstructed temple. And a lot of people probably think that this is not really part of the uh, original Ezekiel, which ends with the bones vision and the people uh, destroyed and so-called Gog and Magog and all that sort of thing. But then you see in chapter 40, it picks up again. Like in 39, it has, and I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall pour out my spirit on the house of Israel. You know, you see things like that, and you immediately realize that the descent of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is based on a, on a just a little passage like that from Ezekiel. A pouring out will be a big image in the Dead Sea Scrolls, particularly the enemy who pours out over Israel the waters of wine. It's in the Damascus document, so-called, where uh, it's clearly this is supposed to be the scoffer, the buyer, the spouter of wine. Even the word spouter comes from the word pouring out. In Hebrew, it's hitif. You can go by the roots of words, and so the spouter is the pour out of wine. So he's not pouring out the Holy Spirit, he's pouring out wine. And he's someone who's the ideological enemy at the beginning, and his main action was to have uh, removed the boundary markers which the forefathers of the ancestors set down. Uh, the everlasting heights, as they're called, um, causing them to wander astray in a trackless waste, it said in the Damascus document. The, the, the boundary markers that the forefathers set down is the, is the Mosaic Law. So again, if you want to get into early Christian history, that's a Paul-like person. And, uh, and my reconstruction of these things, the uh, ideological adversary in the scrolls is a Paul-like person, if not Paul himself. And the main characteristic is that he denies the law and removes the boundary markers of the, uh, of the forefathers, which he clearly does in almost every letter attributed to him. No matter how he tries to wiggle around it and uh, do his um, uh, rhetorical uh, flourishing, which he's very uh, expert at, it's always the, the same effect. So that person is called the poor. So there's another image from that one that, that we just uh, talked about here: the pour out of the Holy Spirit, of pour out of the Spirit of God, and here. He's not pouring out the spirit, he's pouring out wine. He's the liar. So these are really very sophisticated images of the scroll time. Anyway, right after that, on the 25th year of the captivity, the beginning of the year, the 10th day of the month, the 14th year, blah, 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 the hand of the Lord was upon me and took me there. And in the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. Well, this is obviously not a historical episode. And, you know, nobody got, you know, he, he's not carried away by the Holy Spirit or something else like that. And, like a magic carpet or jet plane, you know, it's a vision, but uh, a lot of people don't think this is part of the original text. Anyway, from 40 on, it's considered to be the Zadokite statement. The reason it's so interesting, as uh, we're beginning to suspect in this class, is because the Dead Sea Scrolls are Zadokite, basically. And we mean by that they're interested in the sons of Zadok. And then this is the, the promises given to the sons of Zadok. So even though I'm out on a limb, actually he measures the whole temple here, and this is a reconstructed temple. I don't think it was ever built, but in 44, you see, line 7, right before we get to the sons of Zadok. And now say this to the rebellious house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God of house of Israel, let us have no more of your abominations. 
when you brought in foreigners, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh or body, to be in my temple, to defile it, my house, when you offered my food, etc., etc., because of all your abominations, you have not kept charge of the holy things. You have put others in charge of my temple instead of you. Thus saith the Lord God, No foreigner, uncircumcised in heart or flesh, shall enter my temple, including any foreigner who is among the children of Israel. And the Levites who uh, strayed from me when Israel went astray and followed idols, they shall bear their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my temple like gatekeepers, lower order people, and so on. Because they ministered uh, to them uh, before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into uh, straying or iniquity. Therefore I have raised my hand in oath against them, and they shall bear their own um, iniquity if you like. And they shall come not come near to me to minister as a priest or any of the holy things into my most holy place. But they shall bear the uh, responsibility for their abominations. Nevertheless, I will make them keep charge of the temple for all its lower order work, for all that has to be done in a lower order label, la labor. And then we come to this. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they are, they are the ones who will come near and minister unto me and stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord. They shall enter my temple, they shall come near me, my table to minister of me, and so on and so forth. The point is here, uh, uh, Josephus is being very, um, not really um, honest when he claims that the stopping of sacrifice on behalf of foreigners in the temple was a thing which our forefathers were before unacquainted with. Because it's right in Ezekiel, nothing of that kind should enter the temple at all. And uh, nothing from people who are, you know, idolaters or something of, of that kind. So, so he's not being forthcoming, and he's uh, being rather uh, disingenuous there. He knows very well what Ezekiel said. And that, actually, I'm not for it or against it, I'm just telling you a fact. And that is really um, the thing that is part and parcel of how the Dead Sea Scrolls see the sons of Zadok. So they are actually uh, uh, featuring that. They're actually featuring that particular passage. And we'll see in the Damascus document, that's one of the key passages in the document in column four, where they say, you know, they take Ezekiel 44, 15, and then they, um, they expound it in their own uh, exegesis. Those chapters in Josephus are very important where he outlines that. Uh, but of course he's on the side of the establishment. He's not on the side of the troublemakers, the assassins and people whom he calls assassins. And as I told you last time I know, before we had the exam, one of the people they assassinated was Jonathan the high priest. That's in the mid-50s. He was the son of Ananus, responsible for the Sanhedrin trial and death of James. Now he's assassinated by the so-called Sicarii, and that's where Josephus first tells you about Sicarii. And those are the people who, at the end of the Jewish war, as I told you before, commit suicide on Masada. But they're obviously not just bandits and assassins. They're religious-minded extremists of the kind we're going to get in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is why I don't think that there's a difference between those people and the people writing the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's just that they wouldn't call themselves Sicarii. <laughs> they would call themselves something quite different. Extreme Essenes, Zealot Essenes, uh, this one writer, Harley Tristan, he put it in a different, clearly different version of Josephus. An early church historian from the 200s in Rome. But there's a manuscript in his name, but we don't even know if, it re if he really wrote it. So it's called an heresiology because it's about heresies. Different sects at this time in the Mediterranean Christian world. And he has this version of Josephus that I've told you about that he says there are Sicarius, that there are Zealotes. And everybody in our field ignores that. So you have this picture, therefore, of um, all the trouble leading up to the fall of, uh, to the outbreak of the war against Rome in 66. It's a pivotal year, which in turn uh, leads up to the um, destruction of the temple, and finally to the suicide on Masada. So um, all those things are. Uh,
covered in these last sections of the before the war, the Jewish War, and the Antiquities. Uh, a few other things that you should remember in order to plug into our history here, if we feel it's necessary, are a lot of messianic pretenders. One person called an Egyptian who comes and occupies the Mount of Olives somewhere in the late 50s as well, early 60s. And then he wants to break into the temple and he wants to uh, circle the whole temple compound with his followers and make a huge noise so the walls will fall down. So he's a Joshua again, come back to life. Just like a lot of that Theudas character I mentioned to you earlier. So we've got two Joshua come back to life. I call these people in these in this study Joshua Redivivus is the Latin for come back to life. So they're Joshua reincarnate, Joshua come back to life. Jesus not only has the name of Joshua, but he's a Joshua come back to life. All these people are, want to be Joshua, come back to life. Like Jesus leads the people out in the wilderness. Someone like, at least according to the Gospels, someone like these people and feed them on in the wilderness like Moses and so on. It's like the Theodos episode, as I told you, where Theodos goes out in the wilderness and shows the people the signs, supposedly, and Josephus rails against these people. In intent more dangerous even than the bandits and the revolutionaries. These religious frauds and pseudo prophets and impostors, as he calls them. So Jesus is, as he's presented in the scripture, definitely one of these people in Josephus' mind. So I can't see that Josephus could be sympathetic to Jesus. So therefore, the testimony for Jesus in the antiquities can't really be. Accurately, how Josephus would have presented it, because he's so antagonistic to all these what he considers to be postures, impostors, uh, magicians, uh, pseudo prophets, and he thinks they're all part of the revolutionary movement. So that these people all get together with the more violent people and cause all of the trouble. That's why I really don't consider the Jesus of our scripture an accurate presentation of whoever that character is supposed to be. And I can't say any more about it because I don't know who he's supposed to be and I don't know what he did. But those documents don't tell me what he did. And uh, unfortunately they're taken as you know uh, as uh, historical. Uh, I told you at the beginning of this class for new people like yourselves who are here uh, had a professor at school who said poetry was truer than history. Those are the, the literature, the poetry, and what people do is take the poetry and the literature as history. So we can sort out what did happen to some extent through the scrolls. And the problem is that the Jesus story gets in the way because it's so out of context of everything else we have. So if we throw that into the hopper, then we, uh, then we, then we uh, dislocate the history in some way. Because that's talking about miraculous things, curing, raisings, you know, all kinds of things that are not really considered historical things by scholars, quasi-historical things. So if you put that into the hopper of actual things that were going on here, you see Josephus hates people who do those things. Which brings me to the last character, the character called Jesus Ben Ananias. So it is towards the end where he talks about the signs for the fall of the temple. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. Um, it's what he's talking about, uh, uh, what he calls cleaning up operations, and he's talking about how the Sicarii go down into Egypt and, and how the Romans follow them down there. And um, these, for instance, look here on your page 380, I think it says, The fortress Masada was occupied by the Sicarii under the command of Eliezer, descendant of, of Judas, meaning Judas the Galilean, and so on. So under this, we do have a lot of, um, a lot of material about, uh, for instance, the temple burnt, the city taken, all the prisoners were taken. All prisoners taken from the beginning to the end of the war totaled 97,000. 
those who perished in the long sea to me and uh, 100,000. Uh, he may be exaggerating, but I'm sure it was pretty dreadful. Uh, 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 Holocaust that was unleashed, you see, and most people care nothing about the million 100,000. They only care about the death of one person who didn't even die because he was a superhuman being and he was just doing, doing it for um, some theological demonstration of some kind in their mind. So the, all these other people who were actually suffering the most horrendous fate are ignored and everyone just says, oh, well, they, de they deserved it. They brought it on themselves and so on and so forth because they killed someone who actually wasn't even killed. So, I mean, all that is so preposterous, and yet mankind has um, really um, accepted, as you know, for 2,000 years. So, I, I mean, this, is this, this is the section which I think is so great. It's the temple burnt, talking about the flames and the colonnade and the whole beautiful thing going. The destruction of all this. So, this goes touch base with the New Testament and the Gospel presentation. Was due to a false prophet who that very day had declared to the people of the city that God commanded them to go into the temple to receive the signs of their deliverance. So another one of these people who's giving them the signs this time in the temple. And all these people deserve what they get as far as Josephus is concerned. A number of hiring prophets have been put up in recent days by the party chiefs to deceive the people by exhorting them to wait help from God so to reduce the number of deserters. Well, he goes on like this. So it was that the unhappy people was beguiled at that stage by cheats and false messengers of God. So they, they missed the portents like we did. That foreshadowed the coming desolation. They treated with indifference and incredulity, disregarding God's warnings as if they were moonstruck, blind senses. First, us, and there we go. Now, this is what's come into the gospel too. First, a star stood over the city like many stars in the New Testament that we have heard about. Very like a broadsword, this one was, and a comet that remained a whole year. That's supposed to pretend something, according to Josephus. Then before the revolt, this very, uh, this very unsuperstitious person, right? Then, the, then, uh, then before the revolt and the movement of the war, while people were assembling for the Feast of the Unleavened Bread on the 8th of April, at 3 in the morning, so bright a light shone around the altar in the sanctuary that it might have been midday. So instead of in the New Testament, I think it's the third hour of the afternoon or something like that, I forget, uh, the earth grew dark uh, suddenly uh, at the crucifixion. This one is the opposite. This is three in the morning, the earth grew, everything grows light. You know? So th these are all these, uh, these, these, these funny things, and I think they're all related. Uh, someone has been having uh, some fun with some of these things. Uh, this lasted half an hour. Uh, but uh, This is much more difficult than the one at midday or whenever it was in the, in the Gospels because, of course, you could always say it was an eclipse. You know? But uh, and I think people have been looking for an eclipse for years and years and years and years, but I think it's just a reversal of what you'll see besides here. This is really tough that the thing should go light in the middle of the night <laughs> unless there was one of those... Um, the comets that came down in Central Asia or something like that. It's uh, a funny place. The experience took it for a good omen, but the sacred scribes gave, understood at once that it was an interpretation, and they proved right. And this is my favorite. During the same feast, a cow brought in by someone to be sacrificed gave birth to a lamb in the middle of the temple. <laughs> this is from our great historian here. <laughs> Uh, while at midday it was observed that the east gate of the inner sanctuary had opened of its own accord, a gate made of bronze so solid that even twenty strong men were required to shut it, fastened with iron-bound bars and secured by bolts which were lowered a long way into a threshold fashioned with a single slab of stone. The temple guards ran with news to the captain, who came up by great effort they managed to shut it. This, like the other, seemed to the uh, average person to be the best of omens, but God had not opened to them the gate of happiness they didn't get the real meaning. But the learned perceived the security of the sanctuary was dissolving on its own, and the opening of the gate was a gift to the enemy, and they admitted in their hearts the sign was important of destruction. A few days after the feast, on 21st of May, a supernatural apparition was seen, too amazing to be believed. What I have to relate, what I suppose had been dismissed as an invention, had it not been vouched for by eyewitnesses. Oh, we've heard about eyewitnesses in lots of accounts. Vouching, vouching for all kinds of things. 
and followed by disasters that bore out the signs. Before sunset, there were seen in the sky over the whole country chariots and regiments and arms speeding through the clouds and encircling the towns. And this is really the, the heavenly host on the clouds of heaven that's talking about. That last vision when he sees armed regiments speeding through the clouds. That's the heavenly host on the clouds. And we're going to hear about that in the war scroll. We're going to hear all about that in Jesus' apocalypses in the New Testament, in the visions that James has, and so on. So that, that's a familiar one, just the language is slightly different, so we don't recognize it. And here at Pentecost, when the priests had gone to the inner temple at night to perform the usual ceremonies, they declared that they were aware first of a violent movement, and then a loud crashing, and then a huge cry, let us go forth. The divine presence leaving the temple before the Roman but an incident more alarming still occurred four years before the war, 62 AD. Remember that, four years before the war. Now this is the only true incident he's got in there. All the rest is like, yeah, to me if I can be crude, rubbish. But this, this, this is a one, uh, at a time of exceptional peace, well, there was never a time of exceptional peace as we've been discovering, and prosperity for the city. One, Joshua, Jesus, he calls him Jeshua, probably it's Jesus in the Greek, son of Ananias, uh, an ordinary bumpkin, came to the feast at which every Jew is expected to set up a tabernacle for God. As he stood in the temple, he suddenly began to shriek, a voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and the temple, a voice against bridegrooms and brides. We've heard bridegrooms and brides parables in the Gospels. A voice against the whole people. Day and night he uttered this cry as he went through all the streets. I believe this one. Some of the more prominent citizens, very annoyed at these home armies, were laid hold of the fellow and beat him savagely. Parallel material in the Gospels. Without saying a word about another Jesus who's supposed to be a prophet, he's supposed to be beaten savagely and so on. Without saying a word in his own defense uh, or for the private information of his persecutors, he persisted in shouting the same warning as before. The Jewish authorities rightly concluded that some supernatural force was responsible for the man's behavior took him before the Roman procurator. This is the type set for the gospel presentation of the trial of Jesus right here. Uh, the date's totally out of whack, but I don't think that's important in terms of where people get material from or how they're handling them. Which is, I don't know what the final conclusion is. I'm just showing you the parable. Um, though, though, though scorched, this is the Roman procurator scourging him till the flesh hung in ribbons. Yeah, familiar. He neither begged for mercy nor shed a tear, but lowered his voice to the most mournful of tones, answering every blow simply with the words, Woe to Jerusalem. When Albinus, for that was the procurator's name at the time, demanded to know who he was, where he came from, why he uttered such cries, he made no reply. In um, some of the Gospels, Jesus is loquacious, but in other Gospels, he, refused, he doesn't answer. I can't remember which one. I don't have it. Uh, but endlessly repeated his lament. Now, Jesus also makes a lament before he uh, is arrested or when he's leaving the city. He has the what's called the Little Apocalypse, where he predicts the destruction of Jerusalem that will be pulled down stone upon stone, according to the Gospels. In any case, uh, he made no reply whatever to the question, but endless repeated his lament over the city till Albinus decided he was a madman and released him. So here's the governor wishing to release the person, but first he scourged him and did all these things to him. Uh, and we do have Barabbas, remember, in the gospel of being released, although he's supposed to be, uh, the crowd is calling for Barabbas or something like that. Uh, but we have the release. There's another, um, version of uh, Josephus called the Slavonic uh, uh, Josephus. Uh, a version of Josephus that came down with the old Slavic language known as Slavonic. That version differs from um, the, our version again, another a different version. And, and there we do have Jesus discussed 
and in the back of your Josephus book here, he gives you the, the excerpts from the Slavonic Josephus that uh, to some extent relate to uh, this issue. And in that version, Jesus is released before he's re-arrested again, which seems to owe a lot to this story here. And uh, till Albina society was a madman released him. Uh, all the time till the war broke out, he never approached another citizen or seen in conversation, but daily as if he learned a prayer by heart, he recited this lament, Woe to Jerusalem. Those who daily cursed him, he never cursed. Turn good for you. Uh, those who gave him food, he never thanked. His only response to anyone was this dismal well oracle. His voice was heard most of all at the feasts. For seven years and five months he went on ceaselessly, his voice, his voice as strong as ever, his vigor unabated, till during the siege, after seeing the fulfillment of his foreboding, he was silenced. And this is Josephus' funny joke here. He was going around the city on the wall, uttering his wailing cry, Woe to the city, the people, and the temple! And as he added a last word, and woe to me also. This is the punchline. A stone shot from a Roman siege engine struck him, killing him instantly. Thus he uttered the same forebodings to the very end. So, in other words, he was never wrong in any of his predictions, including the last one. Then he sums all this up. Anyone who ponders these things will find that God cares for mankind in all the possible ways for shows to his people the means of their salvation. And through their foolishness and evil of their own choosing, they bring about destruction. We have only ourselves to blame, as you know, that famous uh, type of uh, material that we've heard so often. Thus the Jews, after pulling down Antonia, made the temple square, in spite of warning to the prophetic books that when the temple became square, the city and the sanctuary would fall. I don't know about that. But the chief inducement to go to war, and this is something most people miss and I think is very important, was an equivocal oracle. Equivocal meaning it's multiple interpretations. Found in their sacred writings, announcing that at that time, a man from their country would become the ruler of the whole world. Nobody ever pays attention to this little note here. That tells you tremendous things, doesn't it? Because it tells you that the thing that most moved the Jews to revolt against Rome, Rome was the Messianic prophecy. That the war against Rome was a Messianic war. And uh, so in fact the Jews were not killed because they were not Messianic, or uh, the Jews did not suffer this tremendous, grievous uh, tragedy and disaster because they weren't Messianic, because they weren't interested in the Messiah and the Messianic prophecies. They suffered everything because they were Messianic. That's what brought about their destruction and doom. So all these accusations are like totally reversed, not only reversed, unfair, and inaccurate. Because Josephus says, the thing that most moved them to go to war against Rome was the prophecy that a world ruler would come out of Palestine, which we all know now from doing my class to some extent is the star prophecy from Numbers 24-17. A star will rise from Jacob, a scepter to uh, rule the world. And we're going to find that in the Dead Sea Scroll text in about three different places. One in the War Scroll, one in the Damascus document, and one in the Messianic proof texts uh, called the Tolegium by John Allegro, meaning a basket of flowers. So in fact, um, even in the text we have, there. The, it shows that the scroll group is totally interested in the Messianic prophecy. The New Testament's interested in it too. Star or Bethlehem is just a variation of the of the uh, the material here and the uh, star prophecy. A star will rise from Jacob. So for them, it's a star, you know, in Bethlehem. So they, the un uneducated, stupid, benighted mass who misunderstood all these other moments too, according to him. He wasn't going to play up to the Romans, don't forget this book. <laughs> he wasn't going to fly to the Romans, he was only going to tell history and truth, remember. And uh, they took to mean the triumph of their own race, and many of their scars were widely out in their interpretation. In fact, I'll tell you what it really meant, Josephus says. The oracle pointed to the accession of the general Vespasian as emperor of the Roman Empire from 
For it was in Judea that he was proclaimed emperor by his troops. And it's not possible for men to escape fate, even if they see it coming. The Jews interpreted some of these prophecies to suit themselves and laugh the others off till the fall of their city and their own destruction, that their folly stood revealed for all to see, and so on and so forth. But you have to admit that's a great section, don't you think? The omens, the Jesus ben Anias, uh, those are really incredible. And then, of course, the last cat out of the bag, that the war against Rome was a messianic war, fought by people who thought the world ruler was going to come out of Palestine, and then they were deceived. Well, the scrolls think that. See, the scrolls would never apply like Josephus did. The most precious prophecy at that time of the Jewish people to the conqueror of the Jews and the destroyer of Jerusalem and the temple, that would be the height of idolatry and, uh, uh, I don't know what's the word, uh, the height of um, uh, treachery. Uh, maybe a better word, cynicism. That would be so cynical to do. Obviously, that's not who it applied to, or that's not what the people thought that it, that it meant, and that was not what the original framers of these materials ever thought had in mind for that prophecy, or that oracle, or that prediction, or whatever it is called. And so this is just a totally cynical uh, interpretation to suit the uh, Roman, uh, the rise of the new Roman imperial family. Uh huh. So now we know how Josephus survived. How did he survive? By posing as one of these posturers and interpreting Jewish ancient uh, prophecies to suit the conquering Roman generals of the place uh, where he had been captured. So it is he that actually went before Vespasian and said to him, "You are the world ruler that the Jews are expecting uh, to come out of Palestine to rule the world." So what did he get in return for that? He got a freedom, a pension in Rome for the rest of his life, and adoption into the Roman imperial family, a la, a la, um, a la um, Ben Hur or somebody. Uh, and uh, also that he wrote the history of their exploits as well. So he's the one who said that their rise was predicted by ancient Jewish prophecy. Now I've told you most of this, but last point. Who's the other religious figure at this time that makes the same thing according to some of the literature? It's the famous rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. He's the founder of rabbinic Judaism. He's the founder of the Judaism we all practice or honor today. And, 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 and what's the story that's given about him in the rabbinic Talmudic literature? That rabbi Yochanan, whose nephew, by the way, I've just been working on this material. It's in the stuff you guys have been working on for me who uh, was the leader of the bar Jonin, supposedly, the Sicari, if you like, of Jerusalem, uh, spoke to his nephew before Jerusalem was going to fall, and uh, the nephew agreed to let him go because they weren't letting anyone leave the city, and everybody was starving. There. And you have a whole uh, picture of the siege in Jerusalem, there, in, uh, in Josephus. And he was smuggled out of Jerusalem in a coffin. But they put some dung in the coffin, to make it stink like a dead body and so on, but that's all in the rabbinic literature. And the Romans, by the way, pierce it with their uh, with their swords supposedly uh, to make sure that he's dead. And that's where you get the piercing with the lance in the New Testament literature. And two of his disciples, two of his disciples, they're called disciples in the rabbinic literature. They uh, go outside, and of course that's the only way out uh, because uh, no one was allowed out who wasn't dead. And so he'd have to be dead. So they take his body, he's supposed to out for burial. And when he gets out there, he has an arrow shot into the Roman cat, according to the Talmudic legend. And this is not very accurate, um, particularly any more than the Gospels, I'd say. Uh, but in any case, uh, he has an arrow shot into the Roman camp, saying, Rabbi Yochanan is a friend of the emperor. Now, nothing could be a big, bigger traitor than that. Here's uh, the people, the person who's besieging the city, who's about to destroy your people, destroy the temple, destroy everything else, and you shoot an arrow into his cap asking for special favors and saying you're a friend of the emperor. I mean, that's like, um, I don't know what you would call that. That's, uh, that's what we call traitors in the modern uh, age, I think. 
Anyway, this is the person glorified in rabbinic literature as the founder of rabbinic Judaism. Well, now you understand to some extent why um, they uh, so value him, because through him, their form of Judaism was able to survive. And the form that didn't survive is this form we have here in the scrolls that came back into the caves to haunt us all. So this is another more extreme form of Judaism, apocalyptic Judaism, that was uh, given a short shrift after all these materials were either purposely uh, lost or um, secret in the caves or whatever. But the point is, he then was ushered before Vespasian. Now, it couldn't have been Vespasian because Vespasian had already gone back to Rome at this time. So the whole thing is not historical anyway. It's a legend. But the rabbis are trying to explain why Rabbi Yochanan and they got favored treatment after that. Why Pharisee Judaism became the official form of Judaism in the Roman Empire. Because it was the form of Judaism willing to live with uh, Rome, first of all, the same as Pauline Christianity was a form of Christianity willing to live, not only willing to live, but preferring to live with uh, Rome, as Paul makes it clear in Romans 13. Um, he then proclaims, guess what, Vespasian, the world ruler, come out of Palestine to rule the world. But the point being that uh, Rabbi Yochanan is presented in Talmudic literature as doing just what Josephus did. I believe Josephus really did do that, and the material in the, in the rabbinic thing is uh, very unconvincing, and it shows a transmission process that, of course, we can't really measure, but it, it, it's not a very convincing presentation. In any case, um, he makes the same uh, ploy as Josephus did. And in return for that, what's he get? The Academy at Yavne, which is supposed to be uh, down closer to the sea coast. And it's there that the school of Rabbi Yochanan was set up that becomes the place where the Talmud is finally put together, collected, and so on. And it's where rabbinic Judaism uh, becomes the official form of Judaism. And, time the rabbis there become the Roman tax collectors in Palestine, but that's a, a for a later time. Not now, just the last point about Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, as you may or may not realize, we refer to the Dead Sea Scrolls as Qumran, the place where they were found, because we get tired of keep saying the Dead Sea Scrolls. The, the thing is, is that the people from Qumran would never have interpreted the most precious prophecy of the Jewish people at that time, the Messianic prophecy, to apply to the Roman conqueror and destroyer of Jerusalem. And that is the difference between the Qumran groups and the Pharisee other groups. I try to tell Jewish groups this, I try to tell Christian groups this, I get nowhere. But the point of the matter is, is that it should be clear to everybody what the problem is and was. And if you have children and you want to bring them up and inspire them, I can't understand how they could be inspired by the behavior of Rabbi Yochanan and Zach. And yet that's the behavior that's taught in almost all religious academies in the Jewish world. And you know that the religious studies field is a very odd field. And many of my colleagues have these problems and they can't go beyond a certain point. And uh, I feel that uh, that's why the work in the scrolls has been done so badly. Because it's usually been done by people who can't go beyond a certain I mean, Millick, one of the most famous scholars. DeVoe is, um, they tell you who Father DeVoe is. He's one of the original uh, people who um, had control of the manuscripts in Palestine after the partition of Palestine in 1948 when the scrolls came in. Roland DeVoe, a Dominican priest, uh, I don't have all his hats that he wore, he was an archaeologist and so on. His assistant was a Polish priest called Father Joseph Millick. I think he's still alive. He left the church, I think, sometime back. Defrocked or something like that, I don't know. But when he was functioning in an effective way, he, was, he did most of the work for Father DeVoe. And he was the language man who really looked at all the manuscripts first, and did the translations first. And I don't think Father DeVoe really worked on the manuscripts. He was more of a political person, an organizational person, who also was the head of what's known as the famous or infamous Ecole Biblique, which is really a, the school of French Vatican archaeology in Palestine. 
Jerusalem. And uh, the two of them basically were the heads or the chief personalities in that organization until more recent ones have taken their place. Truly, a school that was founded in really the late 19th century in Jerusalem. So when these texts came in, uh, Father Millick basically uh, uh, worked on them. And they were the organizers of the international team. And uh, this occurred after the uh, war between the Arabs and the uh, Israelis in 1948, after the scrolls came in, and the UN uh, resolution, temporary resolution, the partition of Jerusalem, and so on, so that in East and West Jerusalem, there was uh, no contact anymore. It was a no man's land between them. And Father DeVoe was Johnny on the spot in the east side to deal with these materials that were coming in at that time. And then he had a good relationship with the Jordanian government that ultimately took over this area. And since he was a very high Vatican official too, the Jordanian didn't, government didn't want problems with the Vatican either. So they just, they didn't want this material. Anyway, so they just let Father DeVoe have it all. And he was the person who, who uh, supervised the editing of it through his assistant. I know why I brought this up. I was trying to show you how people under authority really are not able to, in my view, do a complete job of this material. Millick said in his introduction to his book, I got back, 10 years, I'm off on now, 10 years of discovery in the Judean desert was published in, uh, sometime around, I think, in the 1960s. He was, again, father of his assistant, a Polish priest who studied Semitic languages. He said, these people would look like Christians if it were not, this was in his introduction, if it were not for the fact that they did, that they did not have a developed idea of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, that says it all right there. This person is under authority. He believes, or he's supposed to believe, in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So he can't approach these people because he can't see them as, quote, Christian. Because in his view, a, a Christian has to have a developed doctrine of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's not able to do a totally impartial, objective view of Dead Sea Scroll Studies. And these are the people who control all the work done on scroll studies uh, up until we broke the monopoly. So the reason we published the photographs was to break the monopoly of these people so that they were not the only editor. So that everybody had all of the material at their disposal so that we could have basically a thousand voices sing so we didn't have one group of people who had been put in control either by a certain church, religion, government, or, or, or whatever who controlled the materials and therefore spun them maybe inadvertently or even subconsciously or maybe uh, consciously as Bates and Lee would like to think in their own way. So, if all the things are open to everybody, then nobody controls it, and that's why we publish all the things. Okay.